Oh, hey, Beth. What you drinking over there? I just opened a Winer Beer Company Le Tub Wild Farmhouse Ale. And I picked this one because I feel like it fits within the farming theme for today's episode. Mm. So what are you drinking over there? I am drinking a wine called Monogamy. Um, and it's a Cabernet Sauvignon 2016 from California wine country. Um, it's one of the wines that was recommended to me by the blind dude when I was at my uh, favorite place to buy booze. And it just is kind of like a cute little play on like, why would you need any other wine when you know you love monogamy wine so much? So <laughs> it's nice, delicious red wine. And... That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> Sounds delicious. And welcome to We Drink and We Farm Things, the mini-sode. Yay! We're going to talk about the history of agriculture today. Yes, a very brief and buzzed yeah. history. of. Yeah, we're not going to like dig in deep into the nitty-gritty because, well, you don't want to be here all day listening to that, I'm sure. So we're going to take a little fun spin on the research that we did and like Bev said give you a little brief and buzzed history yeah it'll be like the third grade level history of agriculture how does that sound I mean you might be giving us a little more credit by calling it third grade (laughs) (laughs) or maybe you're giving third graders too much credit I don't know third grade was a long time ago yeah I don't remember third grade either (laughs) But before we dive right in, we have to say cheers to our drink sponsor for this episode, which is Christine Sayani at homemade underscore confetti. So cheers, lady. Cheers. So today we'll be referencing material from a few different places, but the bulk of it comes from encyclopedia.com and Britannica.com and a website called crustcapital.com, as well as some fun information Bev found. From a magazine that she gets, like, she actually gets magazines and reads them. I'm not sure who else does that that I know. I mean, I get them, but I don't really read them. (laughs) Okay. But you actually did read them and found some really cool things. So uh, we'll talk about where that came from when we get to that piece of the article, too. But it was very timely for this discussion. It was. So as you probably know by now, if you're listening to this podcast, agriculture also is called farming, and it's the production of food, fiber, animal feed, and other goods by means of growing and harvesting plants and animals. So when you think of agriculture, you can think of the five Fs, food, fabric, forestry, farming, and flowers. But I think there needs to be a sixth F in there, because without that sixth F, there would be no more animals or people for them. <laughs> is, that, is that a sex joke, Bev? Really? It is. It's a sex joke, because I'm like 13. <laughs> <laughs> so six Fs, according to Drink and Farm, the podcast. <laughs> okay. So the thing with agriculture is that there is actually no single simple origin Because it goes so far back that people weren't writing things down. They might have been like scribbling cave drawings, but they weren't like dictating like a novel for someone to read later down the road. So a wide variety of plants and animals have been independently domesticated at different times and in different places. The first agriculture appears to have developed at the closing of the last glacial period or ice age about 11,700 years ago and at that time temperatures warmed glaciers melted sea levels rose and ecosystems throughout the world reorganized the changes were more dramatic in temperate regions than in the tropics yeah and some of the earliest archaeological evidence for agriculture comes from the yellow river region of china And that's where people raised rice and millet some 15,000 years ago. Oh my gosh, that's so long. (laughs) Yeah, it's been a minute. (laughs) Just a tiny one. Mm -hmm. But by 13,000 years ago, when warmer and wetter weather followed the end of the Pleistocene Ice Age. Is that what we're calling it? I just skipped that word, so you're braver than I am. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) 
I just like pretending like I know how to read. What can I say? We can just say the last ice age. (laughs) The last ice age. Um, People in the Fertile Crescent, which is an area that today includes Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Syria, Israel, and Lebanon, cultivated wild grasses, which were the ancestors of barley and emmer and icorn wheat, as well as lentils and chickpeas. The fields of grasses supported grazing animal populations. So a little fun fact is that there was an archaeologist from the University of Chicago named James Henry Breasted, and he's actually the one that coined the term Fertile Crescent in the early 1900s to describe the location as the birthplace of agriculture. And it's also often been called the cradle of civilization, since both the wheel and writing first appeared there, as well as agriculture. So it was like the place to be back post last ice age. Well, and I remember that terminology, Fertile Crescent, and um, Cradle of Civilization from elementary school history classes. So it's pretty cool. (laughs) I think I do recall that as well. So maybe we weren't so far off with the third grade thing. Humans invented agriculture during the Neolithic era or the New Stone Age, which occurred between 7,000 and 10,000 years ago. So there were eight Neolithic crops, emmer wheat, icorn wheat, peas, lentils, bitter vetch, which doesn't sound very good, but I promise it's like a regular herb type of thing, (laughs) hold barley, chickpeas, and flax. The Neolithic era ended with the development of metal tools. And evidence suggests that irrigation first appeared in Egypt and Mesopotamia in the 6th millennium BC. Various people groups began digging and repairing canal networks, which helped to regulate the flow of rivers, such as the Nile River in Egypt. Floods caused by the yearly inundation of the Nile would have had disastrous effects for ancient farmers, washing away dikes and swamping fields. Conversely, when the waters were low, the land dried up, killing the crops. So the canal networks eventually developed into sophisticated irrigation systems, the oldest method of irrigation, which made use of man-made underground streams called quants, Q-A-N-A-T-S. There's no U, so I'm a little tripped up by that. (laughs) I always just make that into a K. (laughs) Okay, canots. We'll call it canots. Somebody correct us if we're saying that wrong, please. Um... And this, like, methodology is actually still being used in parts of the Middle East. So I wonder if back in the day when Egypt kept having these flooding and, like, drought periods and they were getting, like, frustrated AF over it, if they were drinking while they were trying to figure out how to fix it. Because, man, that sounds frustrating. I mean, I think they had all of the stuff that they needed for beer production based on what they farmed. So I like to think that they did. Yes. Or they at least have figured out how to ferment fruit by then. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know what the (laughs) history of wine is. We should definitely look that up and do that as an episode sometime. But in my head, I like to imagine that somebody just forgot a basket of grapes outside and then decided (laughs) to eat them anyways and was like, ooh, this makes me feel weird. (laughs) I need a nap now. (laughs) (laughs) And a snack. Yes. So now we can move on to the Bronze Age and the eras that follow that, where civilization all over the world started inventing and acquiring advanced metalworking techniques, creating even stronger farming implements. And at that time, too, humans started and continued domesticating animals and plants to serve as food sources or sources of other useful products. During the Middle Ages, European farmers began using complex irrigation systems such as dams, reservoirs, and water-raising machines, and they also developed the three-field system of crop rotation and the moldboard plow. These inventions greatly increased the efficiency of agriculture. So I realized we didn't add in the notes here what the three-field system of crop rotation is, but um, I think it's something similar to what we do now, which is like wheat, corn, and beans of some kind we do soybeans nowadays but it was probably whatever their equivalent was back then yeah so basically they figured out you can't beat the crap out of the land with the same crop over and over again around that time that's pretty cool yeah 
Go team. <laughs> and between the 17th century and the 19th century, Britain experienced a dramatic increase in agriculture productivity known as the British Agriculture Revolution. And this revolution consisted of a variety of improvements in agricultural methods. And this took place more or less simultaneously. Farmers developed new methods of crop rotation, kind of like we already talked about. Um, but they began cultivating land that had been marshy or forested and planted new crops such as turnip. Mmm, turnips. <laughs> Yuck. I'm not really a fan. <laughs> nah, I'm not really either. <laughs> So the technology of agriculture has continued to evolve over the years. Plows and other farming implements improved, and the mechanical combine harvester, which is a machine that harvests grain, was invented in the 1830s. It's crazy that that was invented so recently. I mean, I guess that's almost 200 years ago now at this point, but still. Like, right. It feels, I feel really small right now thinking of all of these dates. <laughs> yes. And if you think about it, though, that version of the mechanical combine harvester, like when we think about it, we probably see something very different than what it looked like in the 1830s. But it's still pretty cool that because I made the assumption before this research that this that probably happened in the 1900s, not the 1830s. And that, that we were, they were like walking behind horses with like a single little plow blade back in the 1830s i mean they were probably still doing that and like the fancy farmers had the mechanical combine harvester but i'm making another assumption so (laughs) this is in sam's brain (laughs) (laughs) and the work of charles darwin and gregor mendel in the late 19th century in evolution and genetics respectively revealed the biological basis of the selective breeding breeding that is agriculture. That's right. And cultivation approaches could therefore become more directed. For example, in the early 20th century, George Schull at the Station of Experimental Evolution in Cold Spring Harbor, New York, crossed highly inbred strains of corn and produced very robust hybrids. Use of hybrids ushered in a new era in the ag- in agriculture with many fields planted with the same strains of crop plants, also known as monocultures. But this set the stage for disaster, such as arrival of a pathogen to which all the plants were equally vulnerable. And in the 21st century, farmers plant several varieties of the same crop to avoid the weakness of monocultures. So talk about lessons learned and probably having to drink about it. (laughs) Because they kind of had to learn the hard way there. (laughs) Well, yeah. And we've talked about monoculture farming before on the podcast. And monoculture is basically just like a giant field of all the same thing. And yeah, what happens is like if you live in an area where like corn borers are really prevalent and you grow corn that isn't resistant to the corn borers whatsoever, basically like it's just a giant corn borer party. Long story short. Mm, Yeah. And that doesn't sound like a fun party for anybody else. No, it doesn't. They're super gross. (laughs) Yeah. So now we'll go back a little bit to the early 1900s. And this is when that horse-drawn plow I was talking about finally gave away to machinery. And the first tractors were steam-powered engines designed to haul agriculture equipment and were too expensive for most farmers to afford. And the gasoline power tractor was actually invented back in 1892. So it was available. But again, you had to be that, you know, rich, fancy farmer on the block to be able to get access to that. It wasn't as widely available and attainable to most farmers. Well, and one thing that I heard farmers used to do, like back in the day, quote unquote, is that one person owned the farming machinery And he came to town like during a certain day or week and just did everyone's farms at the same time. And then they paid him for use of his equipment. Yes. And I think that sort of thing can still happen today. Like you guys share a tractor, right? Yep, we totally do. Yeah. And we've talked about like sharing a chicken plucker and all sorts of things. Because like, yeah, I don't need to own a chicken plucker. I raise like, what, 20 meat chickens a year? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's a really big investment for 20 chickens. <laughs> right. 
Exactly. And the last century has seen a host of changes in the way farming is carried out and in the way farm produce shows up on our tables. In 1938, a trucking executive complained during a round of golf about how the summer heat was spoiling much of the food shipped by his company. And his companion, Joseph Numero, jokingly suggested refrigerating the trailers. The idea stuck, and Numero went on to start a refrigerated transport company with the help of inventor Frederick Jones, which is super cool. Dude, that guy's probably filthy rich, or was at the time. Like, <laughs> I mean, I've heard people say like their best ideas come on the like come to them on the golf course or over a martini or something like that and that is just like the prime example <laughs> that business can happen outside of the office <laughs> well i didn't know that there was golf in 1938 <laughs> so meanwhile the development of hybrid seed particularly hybrid corn revolutionized agriculture Hybrids improve the result of planting and often produce plants and fruits that are hardier and more uniform. And hybrid seeds continued to increase agriculture output for the second half of the 20th century. And agriculture biotechnology began in the 1970s, and people in the United States have been eating genetically modified food since the mid-1990s. The goal of agriculture biotechnology are the same as traditional agriculture improved appearance, flavor, and nutritional content of foods and ease of cultivation. I found a really fun, fun fact. That's a weird way to say that. (laughs) In that magazine, Eating Well, um, that I have a subscription to, and in one of the articles that they had this month, uh, they mention that GMOs were originally developed to help free farmers from chemical usage, And the first success was called BT corn and cotton. And what they did was they had inserted a gene into them from naturally occurring soil bacterium, which is called Bacillus thuringiensis, which is probably where the BT comes from. And that made the crops toxic to certain worms and pests that infested those crops, but were safe for bugs and mammals that were not known pests for them. They eventually pivoted to focus on making crops resistant to Roundup. Interesting. Yes. So these changes have not at all come quietly during the past 10 years. A huge controversy has raged over the use of chemical pesticides and fertilizers on farms. And there's been growing awareness of how chemicals impact human health and the environment has led to calls for increased government regulation of the agriculture industry, which I'm sure is well-intentioned by the people calling for it. But, I mean, in my opinion, government doesn't always, like, regulate things in the most efficient way. So I feel like there needs to be a balance. It's funny. It's like a catch-22, right? Um, Like... I am one of those people that I always think that everyone has the best of intentions because that's just what like my (laughs) natural inclination is. And I'm like the opposite. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But I do recognize that when you let uh, large companies or large industries make all of the decisions, they have a natural inclination to make decisions based on what's best for them personally. Which I think is natural, right? Well, and I think one of the things that's important to point out here is that we don't talk about this to try to influence what you Mm -mm. think about any of this. We're just kind of chatting and we're both, I think, openly admitting that there's a lot that we don't know, but we're constantly trying to learn. Exactly. And we purposely keep politics out of our podcast for as much as possible because the point of our podcast is to bring people together to have open communication and conversations and a lot of times unfortunately when those hot button topics come up that are political people get nasty or defensive and and we don't want any of that here so that's why we don't say anything super or that could be considered super inflammatory to one side or the other Exactly. Yes. But new technology in agriculture has continued 
with more experimentation in gene editing. And there's this neat new tool called a CRISPR, and that's C-R-I-S-P-R. And I mean, I don't know how new it is, but it has been in the news a lot because it's a gene editing tool that's used not only in food and farming, but they've also been experimenting with it on like people and animals. It's all super fascinating. But CRISPR technology is a simple yet powerful tool for editing genomes, and it allows researchers to easily alter DNA sequences and modify gene function. And it's basically an enzyme that acts like a pair of molecular scissors, which is capable of cutting strands of DNA. Super cool, super tiny, super fascinating. And you would not want that falling into the hands of a villain to use on people. Oh, gosh, Just no. Saying. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Megamind had better keep his hands off the CRISPR. Yes. So this has been a very brief in buzzed history of agriculture and it's obviously played a huge role in human civilization like we probably wouldn't have made it this far without agriculture so everybody can you know just stand up and give the history of agriculture just like a really slow clap i prefer the slow clap for this but Bob's very puppy. i gave it a fast clap <laughs> so whatever kind of clap you prefer um <laughs> But agriculture, obviously super important. We hope you learned a little something. We know we probably missed like a ton of stuff. So if there's like a super interesting fact about the history of agriculture that you know that we haven't co- covered, like feel free to tweet that at us, comment a- on Instagram, or put it in our Facebook group. And maybe we'll add that as a bit of follow up someday if you tell us something really cool. For sure. Yeah. So this is the end, guys. Um... We just wanted to throw out a few reminders. Uh, If you like us, please rate and review us. And we're doing a new thing for our main episodes where we'll read our favorite Apple podcast review of the week. If you don't have an Apple product, you can download iTunes onto your laptop um, and leave a review that way. Because if we read your review and then put your name in a hat at the end of the month and draw it out, you might win an exclusive coffee mug that is not in the shop and will never be in our merch shop. Um, just make sure you leave your Instagram handle or some way for us to get a hold of you so we can get your address just in case you win. So go do that if you like us. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button and download the episode when you listen. It helps more people like you find us. And also do us a favor and share this episode over on the Instagram in your stories and tag at Drink and Farm. We'll send you a promo code just for this episode that'll give you a percentage off in the shop. And make sure you take a look at today's show notes if you're interested in looking at the articles we discussed, a survey that you can let us know how we're doing. We also have links to our merch shops and Facebook community in there. So check it out. So thanks for listening, guys. Yeah, we hope you enjoyed today's episode. We had a a fun time stumbling through um, in a very buzzed fashion through the history of agriculture. And until next time, drink, farm, and and give give zero zero clucks. Bye, guys. We drink things, we farm things, we drink 